we're here to talk about enabling business transformation. Um, maybe we could go around the table to kick off and say, what does that mean to you? Maybe we could start with you, Adam. What I think uh, business transformation means to me is really about unlocking uh, value in new and creative ways. I think through ways of working, I think through uh, obviously underpinned and enabled by technology. I think that would be the simplest way I would think about it. Mark? I, I like to use uh, sort of our three horizons around transformation. Because for me, it's around the experience and uh, it's the experience both internally and the experiences that your clients, uh, people that use your products are having. Uh, secondly, it's around acceleration. And uh, transformation is, is all around accelerating that journey to the outcomes that you want to get to. But at the heart of transformation is insight, really. And it's insight around, are you unlocking that value? Is the transformation actually giving you something back? And is your workforce really changing to adapt to where the organization needs to be to succeed, succeed against its competitors, succeed in the changing uh, dynamics in the world. Digital is one such transformation caused through the disruption that digital media, digital devices have brought. And really it caused the expectations of your customers and your clients to exponentially rise. So what they're using in their everyday life, they expect in the products they are going to buy from you. That is one type of transformation and undoubtedly will have others that are coming from AI, from uh, you know the things that we are yet to see come into the industry. So that's what it means to me. Absolutely, and Daniel? Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, and they, they, those points made there resonate with me. The other thing is the driving the efficiency in a business. And it's very clear to see that quite often the hygiene factors are um, elements that really slow down progress within the business. And what you really want to do, I think, is focus on the differentiators. And if you can have systems in place that can really um, remove manual work that's um, required for those hygiene factors, be it um, looking after networks or um, any other elements that sort of facilitate business need. If you can automate those and really get the business focused on driving the factors that differentiate yourself as a company against your competitors, that's where I think business transformation can make a real difference in terms of driving revenue uh, EBITDA within the business and effectively be more competitive out in the um, your particular field. Yeah, so competitive differentiation. So last but not least for the little kickoff question, Dave. I tend to go with, you know, what got you here won't get you there and just take it as a very simple perspective, right? So if you're talking about business transformation, you generally join an organization when they've been operating at a certain level and somebody has set an aspirational goal might be the board, the CEO, somebody who's trying to make a, if you like, a step change. And I think it's really then, everything should be up for grabs in terms of what needs to change in order to facilitate that. And trying to avoid, you know, th this, is, this is how we do it around here kind of syndrome, right? How do you get out of the status quo and how do you drive it forward? And I think then it's people, process, technology, right? Those are the, obviously the components we generally look at in that, in that kind of mix. While we're on this topic, though, could we drill down to a, another level, which is uh, that tension that's eternal, as far as I can see, between thinking long term and thinking about quick wins, getting that buy in that we talked about earlier, but also saying, oh, we need to build a platform for the future, not just for today and tomorrow and maybe this quarter if we're on the financial markets. Adam, you're at the heart of a lot of cloud transformation projects with many clients at Rackspace. Maybe you could talk about how you balance that uh, equation? I don't think, uh, based on the clients and the customers that I work with, I don't think there's one single answer. But um, I think it's more and more important to raise the question that says, uh, what are you, if, if transformation is continuous, regardless of its type, right? The idea that uh, 
you know, all of, if technology is enabling transformation and technology is changing faster and faster year on year, the opportunities for transformation are coming thicker and faster and the pressure down, both from the market but from internal stakeholders is becoming greater and greater. So the the bit that I think that, that I see with my clients and customers that they're genuinely still trying to solve for, I don't think anyone's got the perfect, perfect answer is, how do I actually carve out or buy the right to invest in getting better at transformation? And you know, I'd be really interested to hear from, from the group here about what they're doing to you know make the next project better than the last, or the last set of benefits realised faster, or or uh, you know to a higher quality than the last, because I, I don't think anyone solved it yet, and I think all we can do is really talk about and share that experience at this point in time. If I can pick up on that, so um, when we tackle projects at, at Pure Gym, we um, utilise the best elements of Agile. Uh, and one of the things we do is every two weeks we hold a retrospective. Um, and I don't think it, it has to necessarily apply to where you're doing Kanban or two weekly sprints, but it can actually work for big transformation projects as well. So every two weeks what we would do is effectively get together as a group, um, identify the things that worked well over the last two weeks and the things that we um, could have improved upon. And we've got this mantra where we say that um, we've done the best of our ability with the tools that we've got. So there's no blame game here. It's all about sort of improvement as we go. We identify those things and then everyone gets the, the opportunity to vote on the things that they think are most important. And they identify the things that they've actually got control over as well. So it's all very well to say that um, something that's actually without or outside of their remit um, those things are really hard to control, but if there's something actually within the team that we could change to make things better, if it's efficiency, if it's changing the order in which we do things, it means that we can be more focused on getting that benefit. Um, and I think that if you have that opportunity to do that and to look back, you're not only um, improving how you might do a transformation project in the future, you're actually improving the way in which you implement that transformation project you're currently on. And I think that has made a big difference to the way in which we structure things. And it's moving away from that whole Prince to methodology, let's get all of the requirements set up and done early doors before we actually start working on something. It means that you can crack on with that particular project and the point you're, you're making there where, when, how do you seek the best business benefit the idea would be to effectively take the business goals, start with those, how do you achieve those as early on in the project as possible, and consider doing things like minimal viable products, yeah. quick wins, low hanging fruit, to try to get those business benefits much earlier on. So you're trying to weigh up the two and do both in parallel effectively? If you can, yeah, absolutely, and I think it is possible. I think adding to that, because the the continuous feedback and the retrospective are really, really critical mm -hmm. in terms of uh, learning. I uh, uh, totally, totally agree. I think, though, also the continuous measurement, and uh, it's uh, it's continuous measurement. I I, I I see across three three sort of three sort of pillars because uh, you know the prioritization around what happens into a transformation is can be very subjective and maybe a bit biased also into what is important and how do we know that what is important is really important, not only through measurement and actually seeing what the data is telling you and not what you want the data to tell you is really important to enable you to pivot or persevere in terms. And that's really a change in, in relation to by uh, moving through this uh, continuous cycle and uh, of of change is you will uh, come to crossroads and those crossroads really is the data is going to help you so continuous measurement around value and also understanding uh, the, the, the 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 bottlenecks that you are encountering so continuing continual measurement of flow is really important in terms of what's going through that cycle uh, and What's coming out in terms of have you built it right? I think the thing I find with transformation is um, you tend to run so many projects 
through the process. You can't necessarily isolate which one is having the biggest impact. And so you have to take a more holistic look at the measurements and, and think about you know, the, the trends. Are they heading in the right direction? Because in isolation, you know, a lot of us would struggle with you know, attribution in marketing. Where did the lead come from? It doesn't really matter as long as we're getting more leads and the leads are converting better than they used to. That's the, that's the business goal. Where did they come from? Well, you know, you may never a be able to pin that down. So it's an overall effect that you're trying to have with transformation. And so you do have to focus on measurement. You do have to think about trends because, again, some of those measurements are actually leading indicators. So they're not necessarily turning into financial benefit in, in, a, in a time frame that equates to a quick win. So the company I work for, you know, we, we can have sales cycles that are five years long. So how can I justify investing in digital marketing and say, and here's the return on that investment? I can only do it by looking at leading indicators, right? Am I getting more sales qualified leads? Are the sales qualified leads that I'm getting moving through the pipeline faster? Because that's, that's the only leading metrics that I can look at. Was it this form of digital marketing or social media or that? You know, we're trying to do all of it because we're coming from a traditional marketing you know, organization to a digital marketing organization, we're going to do it all, right? And, and what we need to see is that the macro measures are moving in the right direction. There is a difference. We, we obviously have to take care with key performance indicators, as you put out. We talked earlier, Adam, a little bit mm. about key performance indicators and remind me your point. So before I you know, remind you of the, what we spoke about earlier, I think uh, I want to go back to the point that you raised at the very beginning around benefits realization. Um, and um, there are sort of academic studies and, and that have been done around that. And, and the reality is, is when execs were polled around, well, why would I measure benefits when all I'm going to do is find out whether I was wrong or right two years after I made the decision? And, and that was sort of the, the, almost a the word for word response on that. But I think the antithesis to that or the, the, the unfortunate reaction to that is taking something like a key performance indicator and thinking it's a key performance truth, thinking that it's an absolute relative measure of some kind of value creation when actually it might be a leading and lagging in or lagging indicator yeah. of the performance of one or several initiatives together. And I other th also have to compliment you, I think the other thing that you talked about is the idea of how do you split attribution? Because it isn't, 99% of the time it's not possible. That comes down to management judgment. All of this folds in for me into a very big, large, messy ball that comes down to exec sponsorship and clear prioritised objectives. And then understanding uh, as a leadership team, which KPIs align to the compass points of those objectives. Whether that's four million units of objective or three million units of objectives, the point is it's the trend is going up. And if these three or five of these things are green, it's going up. Um, you know, the idea that you can look to a five-year plan or look to a, a project in 12 months' time and say it's going to deliver on the 15th of December at lunchtime, you know, none of us have the ability to do that. Um, but that's where we have to use measurement to understand that we're moving in the right direction at the right velocity with the right quality. And the bit that goes from that to the outcome, that for me personally is management judgment and management buy-in. And that leads us nicely into the next section, which is uh, about the importance of culture. Uh, and uh, we need a group of geniuses, luckily we've got them here, to uh, address these softer issues of how do you build or develop or foster or encourage that culture so that these changes become accepted, uh, they create enthusiasm. Uh, I'm sure you've all uh, seen examples of what to do and what not to do. Any war stories you'd like to share about fostering culture? I guess I'll just jump in. I think there are lots of smart and good IT leaders in this room and, and, and about today. And no doubt you, you will probably have a, you know, a, an IT team, a technology team that um, wants to keep pushing, is engaged, is really interested in trying new things. People entering technology careers today, if you're not a kind of a learner by kind of natural behavior, you, you, you're potentially making the, the wrong career choice with, with the rate of change. I guess uh, I see the bigger challenges in the, uh, around true transformation is where you're trying to foster a culture across silos. So less potentially worried about, I mean, don't get me wrong, you will always have those looking after legacy systems and whatnot. There's a, 
you know, potentially some hidden boroughs of, of, of kind of pets and cattle type mentality. But I think the biggest challenge around transformation fundamentally sits with the changing culture that has to be driven across departments, not just in terms of different lines of business that consume IT, but other general and administrative functions that enable the business to run faster, um, and also the cultures around decision making. So we have you know, talked about at length, both I think sort of previously amongst ourselves, but also in the industry about big transformation projects and looking to make very big decisions and do very big lumpy things versus being comfortable with a more, I probably don't like the word agile as much as you like the word journey, but a more agile approach to decision making which deals with uncertainty but allows things to move much faster with more uncertainty where perhaps, as Daniel, you mentioned earlier, you haven't done all the design up front, you know, as an example. So that's where I see the biggest cultural challenge at the moment. And those customers that I work with that embrace it uh, tend to go kind of all in with making sure that all departments are lining up besides uh, under all of the things that need to change. And we, I used that example of common language earlier. I met with one uh, CIO and we were looking, they, we just sort of migrated them into a AWS from a traditional on-prem environment. Um, they are across sort of 30 countries and each of the 30 countries could effectively be considered a, you know, a separate business. So we'd done the first six countries and they were trying to work out how to do the others. And the challenge we faced was, for example, is legal didn't understand the, the technical language that underpinned the new technology base. The in-country country managers from a sort of a, a managing director, general manager level didn't understand it. And one of the things that we talked about, for instance, was taking yeah, whether it's that cloud provider or another cloud provider and just doing a basic level of business education around here is the new language of, of, of IT, AKA the widgets that you buy, um, so that when we come to the table to make a decision around a cost, a design, you know, some of those business fundamentals that you're traditionally going to, to make, um, you're comfortable with those decisions because you understand the language. Um, the other th the thing that I would throw into that is, is that's a real challenge and that was self-evident in, in a dinner that I was at a few months ago where one of the CIOs put on the table kind of a wish list which said, I wish the CEO would spend as much time understanding this new technology when I bought it to them as they would the new finance mechanism when the CFO sat down with them to talk about some kind of refinancing. And I thought that was a really, really interesting, you know, intentionally contentious point, but it's really valid, right? You know, culture comes from top down. Um, and CEOs, COOs and CFOs, as much as CIOs, have to uh, value all of the change that's got to occur and value the new language, the, the new language that we're going to bring them and the, and the new uh, mechanisms that we're going to want to put in place. I think the other part of things with, with culture is the, the end users, the staff. Um, because when a new transformation project um, comes into play, there's a lot of... Uh, feeling of unease, you know, is it, is it going to change my job? Do I have a job still? And I think it's very important to address those worries, those concerns, because ultimately as a business, you need to continue to function during that transformation project, which could take a significant amount of time. And what you don't want is a whole set of people deciding to leave the business because they're worried about their job prospects and how their, their job's likely to change. The other element as well related to people is training and one of the things that I've seen before with big transformation projects is that that's really forgotten about because the focus has been on um, the implementation, is the design right, are you going to be testing this thing properly, is it going to get delivered on time and then it's launched and suddenly you realise no one really knows how to use it. So I think that has to be absolutely fundamentally part of the project plan um, to, to cover off those sort of important people issues. I, I want to pick up on that, that really interesting point around you launch something and no one knows how to use it. Mm. And there is a, there's a push and a pull to that in terms of you could deliver all of the training in the world and it doesn't go in or people turn up and they check off check out, they hop on their phone, they do email while they're in the training. So you've done all of the things that mm. the textbook says to do. The biggest challenge that you have is 
making them want to be trained, making them buy into why for them personally on a very personal level for that new system. And that is the, that's the difficulty, I think. Um, and one of the challenges around what we're talking about from a kind of continuous transformation perspective and the fact that change is the constant is you're constantly having to figure out that why is it real for that individual at that point in time. Whereas when we used to do sort of the larger Bing Bang stuff, you'd figure it out once and then you would just drive that for six months, but you're almost having to figure out that new benefit paradigm every month, every quarter. I think what's interesting is that you know, there, is, there is no one organizational culture. That's the problem, right? There's a culture in every team, often in every floor, every country. And, and, so the, and, and I'm not necessarily certain it's top down, right? I think culture is, as I said, it's, it's a very localized kind of problem. And frequently I find that, you know, say you get a small team, they will, they won't talk about individuals in other teams, they'll talk about labels. So they might blame a supplier or they might blame finance or HR not the person and until you break down those barriers you'll never get cross-functional kind of buy-in you'll never get an understanding of why you need those end-to-end -end kind of changes that we've been talking about because it's like well i live in my eco you know, my little ecosystem here this is all i know and, and we're a little clique and we're going to have our little culture and we're going to go to lunch at 12 o'clock because that's what we do and then we have you know we're very localized and it's their fault not ours and so often you find that, you know, everybody's up for change because they think you, they, you mean the other people, not them, right? We don't need to change, do we? Because it's their fault. Whose fault? Well, HR, well, who in it? Well, HR. You know, it's that kind of problem that you, you face a lot of and trying to break those down, those barriers down, that's, that's you know, a huge challenge. I think. Bre 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 breaking down the silos, the, 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 the ownership is so critical in terms of the cultural change and actually calling it up. I, it, it, what, what you were talking about uh, brought, brought another example, the two examples actually, one of which is uh, like, you know, the uh, introducing DevOps or moving to the cloud and then moving to uh, continuous uh, deployment, yeah, continuous integration. And then you have the QA, the QA team saying, well, this is stuck with DevOps, or uh, the DevOps team saying, well, uh, it's QA didn't do their job. That's where, you know, an example of the, the, the siloed organizational nature within, within an IT or a digital we, team. Within a new world, right? Within a new world. Where, where you shouldn't have silos, yet yeah. we still have them, and labels. Yeah. And labels, you know, and it's their fault. Incredible. And actually breaking it down, yeah. and actually saying, you know, actually it's, this is an empowered product team, and getting towards that little unit that actually can execute change is, is really where we, where, you know, when, when we say, you know, breaking down the silos and breaking and being more cross-functional. So that's, that's one example. That, uh, that, that sprang to mind when I, and the other example is around, you know, the communication of a journey. So uh, it's, uh, I, I recall going in and saying, you know, the North Star is we need to automate, yeah? We need to stop doing manual effort. The consequence of that North Star message was I saw, I seen the attrition in the uh, QA team rise exponentially because the manual, Manual QAs were saying, well, so I don't have a job anymore. So it, 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 it's, it's really interesting to, uh, and, and, and easily t uh, traps you fall in through. I think it's interesting when we, we talk about business transformation, right? And one of those, you get some classic examples nowadays, which is one, you know, if, you, if you're in an organization that there's a lot of M&A, right? The acquired company does not want to comply with the group standard. Right, because they are again, they have their own culture. Right, they're, they're they're very resistant to being sucked into the bigger picture. So let's go round the table. We've uh, come to the towards the end of the the session, but it'd be a great idea if we could all distill it down in one format for doing that. Might be to say, you know, over your respective careers, what have been the the key lessons and learnings, painful or otherwise, uh, as you've experienced uh, uh, business transformations and continuous business transformation efforts. Maybe we could start with you, Daniel. Yeah, sure. I mean, I touched on it a bit before, but it's where um, you get uh, analysis paralysis. 
I worked on this, uh, this very large system. It's a multi-year um, implementation. And um, it was actually one of my first jobs that I had as a software engineer, so my background in software engineering as well. The key part of that project was um, making sure that the system was able to provide the necessary needs. The, the way in which the project was um, implemented was that a great deal of time and effort was spent on high system design, subsystem designs, and then getting right down to um, what um, classes and objects would be identified, even down to the fact that um, identifying the individual um, methods and fields against each one of those classes. Ultimately, that project um, was doomed to failure because it, we spent years effectively designing this thing and not actually really getting down to implementing the code. So that's, that's one of the sort of key problem areas that I've, I've experienced in the past. I think, you know, this conversation and through, 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 through my career, I think what, what I, I came to realize is uh, change is continuous, so measurement needs to be continuous. And uh, you, a, a transformation never ends. Uh, as much as uh, the outcome of a project is not the end of a product, it's actually the birth of a product, which is going to continue working for you until it, it, it goes away. So you have to continue investing and evolving it. Continuous measurement is one. Uh, secondly is people, and, uh, and people make you or break you, really. It's, uh, whereas you can have a strong leader and a strong vision is if you don't have the right workforce around you that is, uh, that is able to actually tackle the, the changing dynamics, uh, you need to really understand it. You need to really uh, see you know, if you need, what you need to bring in or how you can evolve what you have there. So um, talent acquisition and uh, talent development, really, really key as well as analyzing what you have in place. Thirdly is the messaging and actually um, it, it's, it's around moving from uh, fixed, uh, fixed time and uh, uh, it's through again continuously looking at how you're doing against your, your strategy, against your plans and, and try and break those down into smaller pieces, avoiding big programs have been scarred with big programs. So I try to avoid them like the plague. Um, uh, but how can you unlock value through small iterations that actually give you the ability to decide whether to pivot or to persevere with something? Fantastic. And briefly, if you could, Adam, and then finally, Dave. Sure. I think two things for me. Start with the end in mind. And I, what I specifically mean by that is make sure that everyone that needs to be key to decision making during any big transformational program really understands why you're doing it to the point of stacked ranked objectives you know understanding a one two three priority and understanding where disagreement lies you know thinking about things like Lencioni's five dysfunction of the team from a leadership perspective understanding who thinks priority three should be priority one but who ultimately has the say that priority one is priority one I, I genuinely believe that that's super important and I think at the grassroots level, the people level, um, the one thing that I've learned is to hire for behaviours. I, I build a team based upon uh, behaviours and the way that they show up to others and the way that they think about problems rather than potentially technology skills. I think you have people that need to have a certain amount of experience, um, but it's a way someone tackles a problem or tackles a task and the way they interact with others that um, tends to more consistently unlock value as you go through crazy change or continuous change. And Dave Last. So <clears throat> for me, it's, a, it's effectively a form of analysis paralysis, perhaps is, a, is one way of looking about the innovator's dilemma. So it's exec teams who are, if you like, unable to, to actually go through the change because they're so wedded to past success. And you know we know there are plenty of examples of organizations that have failed to go through that transition. But again, I think they can say that they want to do that type of transformation, but their behaviors will soon indicate that actually they're quite happy with their bonus as it, as it is right now. And they don't really want to make the changes and the sacrifices that for the greater good. 
So I think there's, you know, again, that's that short term, long term view. Excellent. We kind of got around all the questions in a slightly roundabout way, but that's okay as well. Mm -hmm.